So today, what we're looking to do is to talk to you about Cisco Cloud Lock, and more importantly, how we can protect your cloud applications in the cloud environment. What we're going to be talking about is a number of different areas today. Firstly, why is there such a great interest in CASP or Cloud Access Security Brokers? And why, why are we seeing this in, recently? We're also going to be looking at what actually our customers are looking to protect. How Cisco can help, which is a bit more detail about our solution, Cisco Cloud Lock. And then we're going to be showing, showing you a demo. And we're going to finish off by going through a real security assessment. One of the things that I hear a lot about from customers is the type of visibility that tools like CloudLock can provide. And we're going to show you a real assessment there to show you what kind of visibility and analysis that we can provide within your cloud environment. So first and foremost, first and foremost, why are we seeing such a huge interest in the CASP market? I think it's really down to two reasons. Firstly, obviously GDPR is the tip of everybody's tongue, and Yoni is going to take you through a bit more about GDPR in a few moments. I do think one of the, the main reasons is the way that we work has changed, and quite significantly. If we just take a look at this example here, this is an example that I love to give to all my customers. It seems to very, resonate very well with them, and I hopefully it resonates very well with you today. So this is Michelle. She's a sales rep. She could be a sales rep at an organization like, like yourself. She's currently in her headquarters and has a meeting with a customer in a branch office. She starts working on a PowerPoint presentation, and she realizes she needs to get to the airport to get her flight to her branch office. So then she uploads her PowerPoint presentation into her cloud collaboration folder, which in this case is Box. But it could be Google, it could be Dropbox, it could be Office 365. She then makes her way to the airport. At the airport, she realizes she has a bit more time than she thought, so she goes back into her Box folder and continues working on her PowerPoint presentation. She realizes she's got even more time, so then she goes into her cloud CRM tool, which in this case is Salesforce. She then gets a flight, makes her way to a branch office, where she's able to go back into her box folder and then complete working on her PowerPoint presentation and all set for her customer meeting. Now, I'm sure this sounds quite familiar to everybody on the call today. We're very much living in this any way, any world, any access, any time kind of, kind of existence right now. And there's a huge amount of efficiencies and productivity that we have because of it. But also, a lot has changed. Now, I'm not going to go through all of these today, but I'm just going to highlight two of these key areas what has changed. Firstly, at the top of your screen you'll see here, the, the business critical applications that we are now using are all being hosted in the cloud. We're very much living there right now. And secondly, the way that businesses are run and we are living our lives is very much working wherever we are. If it's in the office, it's in the airport, it's at home. And also, cloud is enabling a huge amount of collaboration between other organizations, sharing cloud apps, working together and collaborating from that. And what this means is new risks from today, risks that we haven't seen previously. First and foremost, that users are not protected by the traditional security stack. The stack that we've been building for the last 5, 10, 15 years or so is still very important. But the new area that we're working in and living in, in within the cloud is no longer protected. Secondly, and perhaps I think in many ways most importantly, this is something that I hear almost every single day from CEOs, CIOs, CISOs, IT managers, IT directors, that they have not got any visibility anymore what's going on within their cloud environment. They love the cloud, they love what it's providing their organization, but they can't provide any security policies without actually having the visibility about what actually is existing within their cloud environment. Thirdly, we're seeing a lot more threats around people sharing sensitive data within their cloud environment. It could be John or, or, or a Sheila in accounts sharing whole files or credit card numbers or cellular records outside the organization. So very new risk here that we're only having because of these new cloud environments that people are using. And then finally, users are now able to install their own applications, potentially risky applications, and provide them access to their corporate environment. So as you can see here, this is very much the change in how we are working, how things have changed, the new risks that we are having today. And this is, of course, brought on the, the new challenges around compliance and GDPR, which Yoni now is going to take you through. So Yoni, over to you. So as you've heard Dan discuss some of the risks associated with cloud adoption, we now have to double our efforts to ensure we're compliant, and in particular, abiding by GDPR. Now, I'm no lawyer, and I'm not going to go through all the legal jargon and clauses that make up this new legislation, but essentially, it's new EU, EU laws that will affect any entity trading in the EU or any entity trading with countries inside the EU. And basically what this 
means is that we need to tighten up the rules regarding how we collect, store, and share our personal data. And the laws that we now have, or that we're going to have, um, will give many new personal data rights to EU citizens, including the rights to withdraw consent, easier access to their data, and the right to know if their data has been compromised by perhaps a cyber attack. And that is just the start. So I'm sure uh, some of you may remember, for those of you who were on the call, what happened in 1995. The law that we have in Europe today covering data protection dates back more than 20 years. And it was first adopted in 1995. So to put that into context, as you can see on this slide, 1995 was the year that OJ Simpson was put on trial. It was the first Toy Story movie that was released. And I'm sure for those football fans on the call, uh, will remember Cantona's kick in the crowd. Um, and for those royalists out there, uh, was when Princess Diana announced her affair with James Hewitt on national TV. But anyway, all of this happened a very, very long time ago and when very few people were using the internet or even had a mobile phone, no one even knew what social media was back then. We certainly couldn't do our online banking or shop online or, or watch movies for that matter uh, online. 17 years ago, less than 1% of Europeans used the internet. Crazy, I know. But today, vast amounts of personal data is transferred and exchanged across many continents around the globe in fractions of a second. Now, the protection of personal data is a fundamental right for all Europeans. Citizens don't always feel in control of their personal data. In addition to that, the EU designed new proposals to help build trust in online services because people will be better informed, or so people can be better informed about their rights and in more control of their information. And more recently, we've had things such as the case against Google with the right to be forgotten. We've had the actual reform of European data protection law and a lot of noise surrounding safe harbor. Now, one of the biggest news stories to hit the press in the last few weeks is Facebook and how the social media platform has been abusing our data and trust. So, like I said, so much has changed just in the last 10 years alone, and we now find ourselves living in a digital world, whether we like it or not. We've put our trust in organizations with all sorts of personal data, and data is used by all kinds of businesses and organizations from insurance firms to banks to social media sites and search engines and many, many more. And in our globalized world, the transfer of data to third party countries has become an important factor in our daily lives. There are no borders online anymore and cloud computing means that data may be sent from Berlin to be processed in Boston or even stored in Bangalore. And this is why we desperately need reform. And in less than a month's time, this new regulation is the result of eight years of hard work from the EU legislatures to get to this stage. And in order to be prepared for it, we must first understand what it is and how it's going to affect us. So remember this, GDPR is to protect personal data. And this can be anything from photos, bank details, social media posts, email addresses, health records, user account details, or even an IP address. The list goes on and on. So imagine if this data got into the wrong hands, and unfortunately, most companies that handle both personal data risk of being attacked by cyber criminals. And losing employee or customer's personal data can seriously damage the reputation of that organization. And in this digital age, the collection and storage of personal information is absolutely essential. So when you put this into a real world context, what does this actually mean for us? Well, firstly, awareness is absolutely key. You should make sure that the decision makers and key people within your organization are aware that the law is changing and that they need to appreciate the impact this is likely to have and identify areas that could cause compliance problems under the GDPR. In addition to that, knowing what information we hold or you hold. That needs to be documented. You need to know what personal data is being held and where it resides, where it came from, 
and who that data is being shared with. You also need to know, um, you may also need to organize an information audit across the organization or within a particular business unit. And there are a whole range of other things that need to be adhered to and, and understood. Uh, here are just a couple of um, examples for you, but being able to identify whether your data is in some form of structured or unstructured form, like I said, where it's stored, who has access, how is it being shared, which applications process this data. Now, it's very important to understand that no single product will solve this issue. It's as simple as that. But having a well-applied technology solution and framework will underpin the success and help you become compliant. Thank you, Yoni. Now, understanding those kind of risks here and what's changed is very important. But one of the key things that I, I see a lot of from customers is what does it actually necessarily mean for them. If we just take a look here, this is a, a very simplistic overview or topology, I guess, of what most of our environments look like today. You have your headquarters, your branches, you have your roaming users as well, all connecting directly to the business critical applications that we are now living and using and creating new data in as well. And it's an area that we call at Cisco the extended perimeter, the extended area that where customers are now needing as Johnny was saying just now around GDPR and compliance, needing to protect. But what actually are customers looking to protect? And there's obviously a number of use cases to say the least, but these are the three key ones that I hear on a day and day basis from my customers, the key areas that they're looking to protect. The first area is around the users and the accounts or the access. Is the person that's accessing your Google or your Salesforce, your Dropbox, your Box, your Office 365 account, the person should, there should be, or has someone breached or hacked their account? Secondly, around data. What data is currently residing within your environment? Um, some companies aren't allowed any PCI, any credit card data, as examples to even function as an organization. And what data has previously also been shared as well? And also, what can you do moving forward around making sure that people can't share sensitive, important information within your environment, um, inside and outside the organization as well? And then finally, when we're talking about applications, we're here, we're talking about third-party unsanctioned applications. And this kind of comes into two areas. The first area is shadow IT. It's probably a name that most of you have heard of today, quite common. The, the idea that, as an example, here at Cisco we use Box. If I decided to use my personal Google or Dropbox account, that's a shadow IT issue because what I'm able to do then is store all my, take all my company data, store them within my personal environment, my company no, no longer has any visibility of that. And that's obviously a huge risk for an organization. The second area is around OAuth. So, and I'm not going to go into too much detail because Johnny's going to take you through it in a few moments, but it's another attack vector. It's another area of threat and concern for customers today. So now I think, Johnny, you're going to take into a bit more detail around this kind of shared responsibility um, around what CASPI can offer our customers. Thanks, Dan. So responsibility for security in the cloud used to be a big gray area with many wondering which security measures fell on their shoulders and which security measures were built in by the cloud service providers. Well, now the dust has settled and the smoke has finally cleared with resounding acceptance of this shared responsibility model that you see in front of you. So cloud service providers are responsible for the physical, legal, operational, and infrastructure side of things when it comes to security and securing their technology that they sell. But we as businesses and users are responsible for the secure usage of the underlying cloud services. Now, creating, modifying, storing, sharing, even accessing data in the cloud are not necessarily risky actions, but it's how users decide to share and with whom and what type of data that ultimately determines the risk that the organization is taking on by leveraging cloud services and cloud adoption. Now, in the last two years, we're seeing an increasing trend where more and more organizations are implementing a multi-cloud strategy or cloud-first strategy even. 
meaning they're deploying more cloud SaaS applications and infrastructure as a service such as AWS or platform as a service such as Microsoft Azure or even Google Cloud. Now this was unheard of just over two years ago and therefore relying on the cloud service providers to provide that visibility and security enforcement isn't enough. Um, whether it's around understanding when incidents occur or being able to pro uh, provide additional remediation capabilities, you cannot rely on one single provider to give you that level of security and, um, and expertise. Now, we see uh, an increasing trend when, uh, when we do security assessments with our customers. And, and this is just one example. Um, have you ever been to 68 countries in, in a single week? I mean, that's unheard of, obviously, unless you're, in, unless you're Superman. And we also have another example here um, as to why cloud user security is so, so important. So Dan, if you move over to the next screen. Um, so we, here is an example of suspicious activity where you have users logging into two different applications from two different continents within a single hour. Now, unless you're Superman, that's pretty much impossible and needs to be addressed and looked at as soon as possible. Now, what you're seeing here is that an account could have been compromised. It could have been breached or even stolen. And being able to alert on suspicious logins and activities which would indicate some sort of account compromise where data may be extracted or malicious operations are occurring is, is extremely important to identify um, if, you've been a, um, you know, if you've been attacked in some way, shape or form. We also have another example in terms of data risk. So who is it that owns the most amount of data? Who's sharing the most amount of information or exposing the most amount of information in, in the cloud and on the internet? And who within an organization is actually installing or self-enabling or authorizing access to unwanted or unauthorized or unsanctioned applications that IT have no visibility of? So we have a statistic here which is taken from our threat intelligence um, team of researchers. And when you break this down, what this is actually showing you is that 1% on average of users within a single company or organization are actually causing 99% of the risk. And that's because this 1% of users own the most amount of data, sharing the most amount of information, exposing the most amount of data and installing the most number of applications. So it's these users in particular that you need to address more of your attention on to identify any potential risk. Now, it's not often that a completely new attack vector becomes widely known, but that's exactly what happened three days before um, the WannaCry ransomware attack occurred last May. And this is to do with OAuth, okay? Open authorization, which was used in a Google phishing attack that compromised over a million accounts in two hours. In fact, two million Google accounts and users were impacted by this in a space of three hours. And it was used by the hacking group called Fancy Bear or Pornstorm, who you may have heard about in the press recently, who are responsible for various phishing attacks and phishing campaigns, both for the Democratic National Committee and the campaign of the French presidential uh, candidate Macron, um, who's now the new president, um, a couple of years ago. So what you're seeing in front of you is actually uh, an example of what happened, well, not an example of what actually happened last year. So users received an email from a known contact asking them to open up a Google Doc. Once that user clicked on that link, um, this would then place the unsuspecting user through a legitimate OAuth login flow where the malware asked for access to that user's email which had read, send, delete, and even manage access to that user's contact list and contact address book as well. So the malicious email would then be sent to the user's contacts leading to, the, to a viral spread, okay? And this is not just a one-off. This has also occurred in the Microsoft ecosystem as well, both leveraging um, phishing and OAuth. This is actually an example, or this is actually um, 
an explanation as to what OAuth is, but essentially, it's basically giving users the ability to um, link their internet accounts with a third party application. So uh, Dan, if you move over to the next screen, we have some examples here. So anytime you're browsing the internet and you see any of these buttons on the web page, this is leveraging OAuth, basically giving you the ability to sign into that application using either your Outlook or Office 365 account, your, your Twitter or Facebook, LinkedIn, and the list goes on. In fact, if you look at another example here, you have Spotify, which gives you the ability to log in to Spotify with your Facebook account without you ever having to create or register or sign up for a new account. So it's very, very simple. In fact, it's groundbreaking. Every single application that is created online right now is pretty much leveraging this OAuth capability. But you have to be wary of the risks. Now, to date, um, CloudLock has analyzed and uh, detected more than 400,000 unique OAuth applications. Okay, um, You saw some examples there. Uh, Twitter, you saw Spotify. That's just one example of uh, of this occurring. So I'm going to hand back to uh, to Dan now, and uh, and he can take you through some other things. Thanks very much, Johnny. So as we showed there, the, there's a number of new risks that are out there that are facing us um, in terms of protecting the cloud application environment. And this is where Cisco CloudLock comes in. This is the Cisco solution for these kind of challenges. As you can see here, it's called part of the Cloud Access Security Market, or CASPI, which is Gartner's term for this, uh, for this technologies market space. Um, just a bit of background about Cisco CloudLock. So CloudLock was formed around 2010 and was very much the pioneer, one of the pioneers of the CASPI market, but certainly around the API approach to um, CASPI. And what that means is that there's no hardware, there's no agents. To um, deploy CloudLock is very quick and very, very easy. You are literally just hooking in to the APIs of the, um, the application that you're working to protect, and then you're there, you're up and running. In terms of a bit more detail, though, in terms of how CloudLock actually works, and again, Yoni's going to go through this in a bit more detail in a few moments when he takes you to the demo, but just to give you a high-level understanding of how CloudLock works and how it can protect against the challenges that we mentioned previously. So CloudLock is a dashboard that you can log, in, log into, um, and then you are protected by a series of rules and policies. Out of the box, there's about 50, 60 policies. Most customers may use between 10 and 15, very much depending, um, obviously, on the customer. Um, and these policies are very simple, very, very easy to, to create um, in terms of the, the regexes at first, but also um, the response actions as well. And they're also highly configurable and highly bespoke. Um, as an example, I was working with a customer a few weeks ago that wanted to have a policy looking at their competition. So every single time a file with any of their competition's name was mentioned that was shared outside the organization, they could have protection against to make sure that they have this very sensitive, very important data um, stored safely and protected. So just to go through each area here in terms of how CloudLock can protect, protect yourselves. So firstly, in terms of the first area that we mentioned before, the access. So at CloudLock, what we're doing is we're looking at the behavior of the user, not necessarily the credentials of the user. So as an example, and as Yoni mentioned earlier, when we've seen examples of people logging in from different locations through different apps, so it could be 9 o'clock in the morning, you log in from your Google account in London, and 10 past 9, someone's logged in from your Salesforce account in Boston. Obviously, you can't be in these two places at once. From a credential perspective, everything is fine because someone actually has stolen your password. But obviously, from a behavior perspective, there's no way you can be in those two locations at once, and hence, there is a potential breach. Likewise, if you've got no offices in, say, Australia, and someone's logged in via Australia, why has that happened? Is someone on holiday, or have you been breached, or have you been hacked? So again, CloudLock can make you aware of that through its rules and policies. Secondly, in terms of the data, well, the first thing that CloudLock does, it scans your environment. It provides the visibility to exactly what is kind of residing there, and also, which has also previously been shared as well, one of the big benefits of the API approach is that we can kind of look back in time. And again, I'm going to go through the assessment later on with you to show you that kind of visibility that we're able to provide. The second area what CloudLock is able to do is provide the policies to ensure that you can't continually share. So as an example, and a credit card example is always one that's um, quite um, prominent and quite interesting for customers, is that say every single time a credit card number um, in a file um, has tried to be shared outside the organization. CloudLock would have, obviously have visibility of that, 
but also allow response actions to be set up to protect you. And these response actions can be very easily um, set up, as Johnny will show you in a few moments, um, but also they are very dependent on the different culture of our organization. So typically, organizations may want to send a notification to the user saying, Did you, are you aware that you try to share um, some information with people that you shouldn't be sharing that with? Um, it could be a note to your manager, a note to the IT director. It could be to quarantine that file, or it could be just to revoke the share there and then. So very much, very dependent, very easy configurable, depending on how you would like to work as an organization. And then finally, in terms of applications, in terms of OAuth, as Johnny was mentioning just now in Shadow IT, CloudLogs are able to provide visibility as to um, who is allowing those applications, the scope of access, what these applications are looking to do, and also give you the power to revoke or ban these applications as well. So again, very simple, very easy to use, setting up your policies, and also very much automated as well, which is absolutely key, because we fully understand how many security tools you have right now, and Cisco CloudLog is there to make things as easy as possible to protect your environment. In terms of how CloudLog actually works, and this is, I guess, the closest to a network diagram you'll get of CloudLog because of just how simplistic a platform it is. So as you can see here, it doesn't make a difference if you're an unmanaged or a managed device. As soon as you're accessing these business critical applications that you're using, um, CloudLog is connected via API. And what that means is that we can understand what's going on, and then through our rules and policies, we're able to provide response actions to make sure that you are protected from those kind of um, potential risks that your users may unwittingly or on purpose sometimes being able to commit. I'm now going to hover and back over to Yoni, who's going to take you a bit more detail about how Cloudlot works and then take you through a demonstration of the platform itself. Thanks, Dan. So unlike a, a proxy-based or hybrid cloud-based uh, CASB solution, Cloudlock is 100% API-based and cloud native. So our approach enables us to analyze data that's been in the cloud from the time that the customer first installed or deployed that cloud service. So whether it's Google or Office 365 or Salesforce.com, Dropbox or Box or any of those public cloud services, we can look back retroactively to identify all of those events and activities that users have been performing as well as being able to identify the data that's been stored and, and how it's been shared. Now, IT can also analyze both cloud to cloud traffic. And an example of this would be Marketo, a marketing automation tool which can send data to and from Salesforce. And there are many, many other examples just like that one. It can also protect the cloud application both from uh, an unmanaged user perspective as well as users with unmanaged devices as well. And finally, all of this is done without impacting the user experience in any way. Because CloudLock is API driven, we make calls to the public APIs that are um, uh, you know, published or released by the, uh, by the cloud service provider. There's no man in the middle. The user can connect to that cloud service in the way that they are used to doing, in the way that that application has been designed. So there is no rerouting of network traffic or, or network configuration. And this is absolutely essential as users will find ways around cloud security that will break functionality and introduce latency or or otherwise get in the way, which is certainly something that you don't want to happen. Now, it's not just about visibility, and it's something very important to mention here. Not only is the CloudOp platform providing visibility in terms of SaaS usage, but we also want to provide remediation and enforcement with the use of what we call automated response actions. And education or educa educating the end users is, is a part of that. So it's not if, but when they do something unknowingly, like storing and sharing sensitive data without realizing or even allowing an unsavory third party application to gain full access to their data, um, we want to alert them. We want to make sure that they're aware of what they're actually doing. And this is fundamental to improving security too. Alerting the administrator when suspicious behavior is occurring with a user and it turns out that his or her account has actually been compromised is also extremely important. And in the event that 
a file has been shared publicly or HR records have been shared with the whole uh, company or customer, you know, uh, domain wide within the organization, that would be a fundamental violation and a breach. So therefore being able to call that data back and only allow the intended owners or recipients to access that information is really, really crucial too. So what I'm gonna do is actually uh, show you uh, a brief demo of the, uh, of the platform. Um, and uh, so you can see exactly what it looks like. So let's, uh, let me share my screen with you. Hopefully you can all see that okay. So what you're actually seeing here is the, uh, is the CloudLock dashboard, okay? So your single pane of glass, so to speak, giving you visibility and control across multiple cloud platforms or SaaS services in one location, highlighting the number of users that you have in each of those applications, how many objects or files you have that reside within that application, and then more importantly, incident management. So CloudLock provides full built-in incident management when policy has been violated. So whether it's exposing data or storing sensitive information that shouldn't be in the cloud or authorizing access to third-party applications, we will highlight all of those incidents so you know who did what, when it happened, why, and you can answer those fundamental questions. We'll also highlight in this dashboard and this window, the policies with the most number of incidents. So credit card numbers is always very high on the list, but also highlighting the users who are initiating or causing most of the incidents. And in this case, the last seven days. Now, as Dan mentioned earlier, we break things down into three key areas, one of which is around behavioral risk, okay? So identifying anomalies or suspicious behavior, um, which is out of the ordinary for a given user. So perhaps a user has um, you know, logged into the network or generated activity outside of his normal country where he is used to working. Um, that is obviously not normal. So we'd want to raise an incident or an anomaly on that. Or perhaps a user has come in from an unknown IP address that is not regular you want to identify that and look at more details of that. What about users that may have admin activities? Perhaps in this example, I've got two users who are generating admin level events, but they're not actually administrators. Hence why we're raising this as an anomaly so you can do some further research and understand what's going on. We also benchmark this against the CloudLock customer base as well. So you can identify whether, whether this is normal or abnormal behavior. And in addition to that, being able to identify both location-based risk and also potential compromised account risk as well. So this particular individual is not just logged in, but generated lots of different activities from a number of different locations in the past seven days. Again, this is not normal for this particular user. He's not maybe traveling on business or he's not on holiday. So what is it that's actually going on here? And then you can break that down further and identify particular things around data risk, which is obviously abnormal activity. So whether it's excessive file downloads or file deletions, I just have one example here of a user who's downloading files excessively. You know, maybe on average, this particular user only downloads, you know, between 10 and 20 files in a single week. So why is it that this particular user has just downloaded a thousand files in a single week? Is it a third party application or an automated script that's running or is it something else? As well as being able to show you which assets or which files have been most popular this week and downloaded um, most widely across the organization. And lastly, we break it down in terms of application risk. So which applications have users been installing or self-selecting or enabling without IT permissions or IT visibility? And we break this down in terms of application risk as well, in terms of what level of access these applications have. Do they require full data access to your Office 365 platform? Or do they have the ability to act on your behalf? All that kind of very useful intelligence we provide you uh, from, this, uh, from this dashboard. We also give you visibility in terms of activities and events across the globe and across 
multiple cloud SaaS applications that you may be running across your organization. So this is a snapshot of the sanctioned applications that have been deployed in my organization. And then we break down all of the different events that are occurring. So whether it's login activities, whether it's file downloads, um, looking at the IP address and where the location is for that particular user. And you can filter this based on platform, application, country, if you start seeing abnormal activity for a particular IP address, or whether you want to view the raw event details, then you can do so here, depending on which application that you guys are monitoring in this particular uh, organization. Um, <clears throat> what we can also do is, um, is look at policies. So we have a whole host of policies that you can uh, enable out the box. This is just a snapshot of just a few of them. Again, credit card numbers is uh, very much high on people's agendas, whether they're processing data, uh, credit card payments or not. They want to ensure that this kind of information is not being stored or shared across their cloud application. You can also add your own and uh, whether it's a regular expression or whether it's looking at event analysis details in terms of where people are coming from or particular events that users are, are generating, or whether it's around context in terms of who owns that data. You may want to monitor specific users or groups within that company, or perhaps how data is being shared. So let me, uh, let me give you a really quick example now. I'm using Salesforce here, and I want to collaborate and share number of credit card payments with, uh, with, one of my, uh, with one of my colleagues using the chatter field. So what I'm gonna do is um, type in this credit card number here. Okay, and um, let's have a look. Hopefully I can spell all right. Obviously I can't, too many eyes watching me. And then if I click share, what will then happen within a minute or two, that data will then be quarantined and only authorized personnel can actually access that data. Now let's show you how that has actually happened and why that is happening. So if I click on uh, one of my policies here that I have credit card numbers and click on this uh, edit option here, you can configure this policy in more granularity. So this is based on a specific algorithm that's being generated. So any numbers that match the LUM algorithm, only then will we raise an incident and that is to reduce noise and false positives. You can also apply a threshold. So you could say, we're only gonna raise an incident if we see X number of credit card numbers in a particular document or insurance numbers or ID numbers or date of births or whatever it might be. You can also apply proximity. So if I add the word Amex or MasterCard and those words are within a hundred characters of the credit card number, then again, only then would we raise an incident. And if we start looking at context, so do you want to monitor specific file types where this data may reside? Or perhaps do you want to monitor specific individuals within the organization and create exceptions to that rule? In my view, we should be monitoring absolutely everyone. It obviously depends on the use case because we don't want to miss anything. And then if we look at exposure, again, we uh, categorize the applications that we uh, monitor here. So say for example, it's Office 365, you may decide to look at data that's being shared publicly or shared with everyone within the organization. So if salary information is being shared with the whole company, then you'd wanna be notified of that straight away and remediate as soon as possible. Or perhaps if people are uh, sharing information with their own personal email account like Gmail or Hotmail or Yahoo or any of these such, um, such domains, People may be exposing or, or you know, removing sensitive information from the company and sharing it with themselves. Now, once a policy has been configured and implemented and a policy violation has occurred, what will then happen is that we'll see an incident. Okay, so this is where we have fully built in incident management inside the platform where you can filter on a particular policy. So say for example, it's the credit card number policy. So these are all the incidents associated in this particular case to Salesforce, but then you could filter it based on a particular application, a particular user within the organization, 
or severity. So you just want to have a look at all the critical incidents that have occurred uh, recently. So here is an example of an incident that has been generated not so long ago in a chatter object within Salesforce. This is the name of the user and this is the redacted excerpt of that credit card number. You'll also then be able to view the incident history, add any notes for incident management capabilities. Okay. Like I said, you can add a whole host of other policies. Uh, so if we look at the predefined list, you can cater for a particular location or a particular industry, or you just want to view the predefined list of policies, then you can do so here. Okay, uh, we have various GDPR compliant policies. Like I said, there is no one product that will make you GDPR compliant, but it's ensuring you have policies and procedures in place to identify this data so it can be protected. And then last but not least, let's look at application usage. So again, covering the third major use case around shadow IT and application discovery. So I have a number of unclassified applications that users have self-selected and enabled and authorized access to either to Azure AD or in this case, Google. You can then classify this based on banned applications. You can monitor to see who has enabled what. You can see whether these applications are still installed. But you can also look at our intelligence that we provide. So let's have a look at applications which are of critical risk. Let's have a look at applications which um, have full data access, perhaps, or applications that have the ability to act on my behalf. So here are a couple of examples, a Zendu, which is a collaboration tool, uh, and Kaizena, which is, a, which is a, an education tool, and they have excessive access. So just looking at this one in particular, this has the ability to act on my behalf, and it has full access to my Office 365 environment. And we say that this is critical because it has excessive access, but also because a, a very, very small percentage of CloudLock's customer base have actually trusted this application. So this is where we have crowdsourced intelligence to determine if a third party application should be granted access to our data. And then we also apply other risk scoring capabilities that combines both our cyber lab team and cyber research team analytics, as well as our crowdsourced intelligence, as well as looking at the various application or access scopes that these applications have. So if I was to click on Say, for example, Kaizena, for example, it will show me what we've allowed to happen for this particular application. We'll show you the users that have enabled this application, whether it's high risk, whether it's been classified, and we'll show you some other intelligence as well. We'll also give you the ability to classify this application too. So whether you want to ban it and also leverage the capabilities of Cisco Umbrella, our DNS, recursive DNS security solution that will uh, block um, uh, any domains associated with Kaizena. And you can also ban it for a variety of reasons or even trust it because you have to use it within your organization. Now, if you need to, and most organizations will do this for banned applications, is that they will revoke access to that OWAR token as well, where you can revoke access to that tokenized access for everyone or maybe only select users and you can also create exceptions to that rule. Okay. Now, last but not least, if I just come back to policies, as we mentioned, it's not just about visibility. We also want to be able to remediate against uh, what's going on too. So we have a list of what we call response actions. And again, I'll come back to the credit card number policy again. I'm going to click on edit. Now, this gives me a substantial list of workflows that I'm allowed to enforce when an incident has been uh, initiated or when a policy has been violated. So maybe you may wish to alert the end user when he or she has been oversharing sensitive information or perhaps quarantine or revoke that file share if it's been uh, shared or stored inappropriately. Or perhaps if data has been shared with hundreds of people by accident, just by you uploading a file into an Office 365 folder, perhaps, you may decide to remove all of those users 
and only allow the owner or the intended recipient to access that information. Um, <clears throat> if uh, users are using things like Spark or other collaboration tools and certain sensitive data has been published in those uh, collaboration tools, you may decide to even delete that message or remove that attachment because it's not intended to be used in that application. So again, we want to build education into this workflow as much as possible to empower the end users so they know what they should or perhaps shouldn't be doing. So again, that's a very brief high level overview of what can be done within uh, CloudLock, um, covering the three core use cases. So looking at user behavior, data risk, and application risk. So I'm now gonna hand back to, uh, to Dan, and, uh, and he's going to give you some examples of the other types of things that we see when we conduct a POV or a security assessment. Thanks very much, Johnny. So as Johnny said here, we're going to take you through a real assessment. So this is something that we're able to do for anybody on the call today. Um, it's a free service that we offer um, to really show you the visibility of what's going on within the cloud environments. And as we've been saying before, that's one of the key things I think that I hear from customers. They don't actually know what's going on within their environment. How can they provide um, security around it? So this, as I said, is a real assessment. Obviously, some names have been changed to obviously protect the customer. Um, and the various employees there as well. But I just wanted to give you an idea of what exactly we're able to provide. As you can see here, we, we try and make it simple and as easy as possible. So we've got the access, the data, and the shadow IT, third-party applications. So we've kind of cut it down into those three sections to make it very simple and easy um, to understand where the potential threats may be. As you can see here, these are some of the kind of policies that we looked at whilst doing this assess assessment. As you see here, it's an Argentinian country from a company from Argentina. Um, so we have bespoke policies in there as well. Um, and we start off with UEBA, looking at the access. So this is what we were able to uncover by doing this assessment. So again here, this is all blued out because these are actually real people's names. Um, but you can see here straight away, you've got two users here with the most admin activity. Now, why is this the case? Is it a shared account? Have these users been hacked or breached? Um, and as you're aware that this is what um, the hackers are after. They're after the admin access. So it really provides some really good analysis and understanding of where that potential risk may be. Also, again, looking at location-based risk. You have no offices in a certain country. Why are there people logging in there from these kind of countries? Again, providing that kind of visibility for you. Login failures, another great example um, of how um, a hacker may have tried to get into an account to understand if that account is still safe and secure. Another area of interest could be, that it could be this one actually, is about file downloads. Um, interestingly, when this was kind of developed, it was very much focused on the idea of, of someone hacking into an organization and downloading loads of files. But um, interestingly, some customers that I have actually find this quite useful for, for um, employees looking to leave the company and perhaps download files and take them to their new organization. So again, another way, another area here of seeing that kind of potential risk and potential breaches within the organization. So that's UEBA, that's around the access side of things. Secondly, I'm gonna take you around DLP, the data loss prevention. The area that I find most interesting, and I think my customers do as well, because the, the, the data that you have within your organization is what makes your organization what it is. And especially with the threats around GDPR as well, um, it's absolutely key to be able to understand what data is residing and also what's currently being shared as well outside your organization. So in this um, assessment that we carried out, only 44% of the environment was scanned. So understand that just under half of this customer's environment. But we found information like this. 51 exposed social security numbers, 63 exposed credit card numbers, 62 um, passports um, exposed. And again, this is people sharing this information from their own environments within the within organization outside to other people. So I understand by doing that, these people outside the organization are having access to this. And also, at times, anybody with a link can access this information. But when we actually de de delve down into to understand what this information actually looks like, we see information like this. So this is real passports from this customer that was exposed publicly. When we do these um, reports for yourself, these click here to view file, you can actually click here to go directly to the file to be able to remediate quick and easy. But you can see here this kind of information that we're able to provide. Very interesting and very important. One other area I wanted to mention around PII data in Salesforce is just to give an example of the kind of data that, that CloudLock holds. 
So if I look here, we only are holding the metadata. As you can see here, all the X's, that just shows that we are not at another risk for, the, for your customer as well in terms of the data that's residing in our environment. We don't hold the customer information, it is just metadata. Another example of things that we're able to find is this. This is something that a lot of customers I see have. It's a file called passwords for the passwords for the whole organization. Again, shared publicly, and anybody with a link can access this. PI, BCI data, salary records as well. So again, we're going to show some kind of data, real depth and data in terms of the information that we are able to um, provide visibility of, which again is very, very important. And again, we are not just looking at the date that we start the, the, um, the POV, we're looking back in time as well to show that kind of data that has been potentially still keeping your organization at risk. So that's DLP. Finally, uh, and you only went into some detail around this earlier, around shadow IT and third-party apps. And again, we're able to provide that kind of visibility about what applications are having access to your environment. And again, enabling you to see which ones are potentially risky for your organization. So this whole idea of this assessment is to provide that visibility. And again, as Yoni was saying previously, this is just one part of what CloudLook can do. First area is the vis visibility, and the second area is the response actions. So that really brings me towards the end of the presentation slot um, for, um, for the, this um, webinar. I'm just going to go back into my last slide here just to show you some details in terms of if you wanted to connect with us at all in anything. Um, I know, Yoni, you've been looking at the chat. Is there any other questions that have come up that you wanted to, to share or ask us over the webinar right now? Yeah, there's, uh, there's a couple of questions that have um, that have come up, which is uh, which is obviously great to hear and see. Um, the first one is around um, licensing and, and, and pricing. Um, so, Dan, do you want to uh, provide any details around that? Sure, Yanni, not a problem. So, in terms of the licensing for CloudLock, it is very simple and very easy. It's per user, per application, per year. So. If you've got 500 users for just you wanted to protect Google, as an example, that's just 500 um, licenses for CloudLock. So it's a very, very simple uh, model um, to be able to, to license for. Okay, thanks, Dan. Uh, I can see another question here as well, which has come through to me. Um, in terms of deployment or installation, so we didn't go into too much detail about this uh, earlier, but in a nutshell, um, it's the simplest and quickest uh, solution that um, can be deployed from Cisco's uh, product suite. I uh, truly say that, I uh, mean that. Um, you can be up and running in five minutes. Um, no word of a lie. And how it works is basically the administrator managing one of those public cloud platforms such as Google or Office 365. So if I talk about Office 365, for example, the global admin will authorize access to the CloudLock API, so CloudLock can start monitoring uh, the Office 365 environment. Um, and that's it, basically. So uh, you will go to a certain site for CloudLock, and uh, you as the global admin for your Office 365 implementation will see a list of permissions that CloudLock requires access to in terms of monitoring and we'll click allow or enable, just like you saw before with the example of Spotify. Um, so it's very, very straightforward. There's no network configuration, there's no proxies or pack files to deploy, there's no endpoints or agents. It's very, very straightforward. You just have to bear in mind that the administrator managing one of those cloud services remembers his password on that given day. Very, very straightforward. Any Thank other you. questions? Uh, me and Dan will still be on the line for another few minutes to answer any other questions that you guys have. I can still see. Um, I've got enough. one. For, I've got one from Mina um, next to me. Uh -huh. Asking um, somebody's interested in one of these assessments. So, if an assessment is of interest to you, um, it's, like you only said, it's very simple. The deployment takes about five ten minutes, if that, um, and then we can do the assessment in the background. What I would say is, you've got our emails here. And Mina's going to be sending out um, our contact details afterwards as well. So. What I would say is just feel free to contact myself or Yoni or Mina, um, and then we can get in touch with you straight away to discuss a bit more about those assessments. But again, very simple, very easy to take you through. Um, and again, as Yoni was saying earlier, it causes no disruption whatsoever um, to your current infrastructure as well. 